Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Bobes, and welcome to the first in the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice series, This is America. This series is a platform for dialogue and conversations around the legacies of racial slavery and its structural afterlives in America. It is a way in which we are trying to intervene in a set of discussions about and have a set of conversations about the present. The series is, will have a number of events. One today to be followed by a, an event on with black female artists on thinking about art, blackness on America today. Another event thinking about black global black movements against racism. Uh, an event around the police in America today and the carceral state. A round table with activists who have been on the ground organizing the various protests and activities. And therefore, what we are trying to do is basically just open up a dialogue and to develop a platform or create a platform where we can have people and individuals, activists, scholars, artists engage in a set of robust conversations about America today. So this is why we call it, This is America. Today's topic with the kickoff this series is titled Black Lives Matter, Structural Violence, Protests, and change, and it's really an attempt to understand the moment. I can't breathe, George Floyd said. I can't breathe, Eric Gardner struggled to cry out as he was pinned to the pavement by police officers. I can't breathe, pleaded Derek Scott. I need my meds. All these three black men died pleading. I can't breathe. Breath. To breathe is a sign of life, of living. And when breath is stopped, brutally squeezed out, then life is brutally snuffed out, taken away. Today, I can't breathe is more than a plea against brutal police action. It is a proclamation a demand for life, a demand that black life needs to live, that all the structural forces which make living while black in America a nightmare, a dream deferred. Let's name these structural forces, white supremacy and black racism, structural forces that have their root in the original sin of America, that is the colonization and then the racial slavery in this country. This original sin of colonization of the indigenous people and then of racial slavery was something that created a historical catastrophe. And in this catastrophe, even when America, when liberty and happiness was proclaimed for all, it was not to be. It was not to be for the indigenous and for the enslaved Africans. Historical catastrophe for these people meant, put it in the words of Malcolm X, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Malcolm said, the rock landed on us. And each time people of color think there is a light, that there is some way in which we can get out of this, American society seems to revert back to a default normal of these legacies and the structures and the practices of anti-Black racism. So emancipation was followed by the institutionalized, institutionalization of Jim Crow and formal segregation in America, the creation of separate and parallel lives, separate yet grossly unequal. Jim Crow was, was instituted with racial terror and the lynching of Black bodies became the order of the day. The Southern Freedom Movement and the Civil Rights Movement opened or seemed to have opened a new door 
but it did not create what Martin Luther King said was needed, a new ground for equality. It made it possible for us to eat at the hamburger counter. But as Fannie Lou Hamer made clear, the African-American struggle was not about eating at, at a hamburger counter. It was larger than that. It was about a certain kind of democracy, a new American Republic, if you wish, one in which black life could breathe. And so we are here today, loudly proclaiming that black lives matter. But we are also angry, angry at the incidence of police brutality, not just against black men, but against black women who are violated in spaces where there are no body cameras. Angry at the disproportionate number of black deaths due to COVID-19, or just plain angry at the continued nightmare of living while black in this America. Yet our anger is tinged with hope. And it is tinged with hope because for many nights, there has been an uprising in America, one in which new allies are openly saying anti-black racism is wrong. Hope because once again, the African-American struggle for equality and for a different kind of democracy has catalyzed a wild scale self-examination of this America. Where will it lead? Will a new normal emerge? Can things be different? Will black lives be allowed to breathe? What steps need to be taken so that this America does not go back to its default normal, structural anti-black racism? These are some of the urgent questions of the day. The Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice emerged out of a slavery and justice com report commissioned by the first African-American president in the Ivy League, Dr. Ruth Simmons in, 19, in 2003. One of our current objectives has been to not only do cutting edge research, but to catalyze difficult and necessary conversations. It is a model out of which we were formed. This afternoon, we want to do that. We hope that we will have a dialogue between the panelists and the audience, wherever you are. And I see, looking at the audience sheet, I see we have people from all over the world. To lead us off in this conversation, we have three individuals who in their own ways are working and thinking hard about these issues. They are Ms. Felicia Donard, a graduate student in Africana Studies, Professor Brian Meeks, the professor and chair of Africana Studies at Brown, and Professor Joy James, the professor of humanities at Williams College. But before I turn to them, first to Professor Meeks first, we will have a set of announcements, I would think, from Catherine. Catherine? Hello, everyone. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions. Although we may not have time to get to everyone's questions, we will have a record of them at the end, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thank you. I now turn to Professor Meeks. Uh, um, thank you so much, Tony, for inviting me. And um, you know, ever since you did, I've had sleepless nights, uh, not only sleepless nights thinking about the crisis we're in and the, the magnificent events of the past two weeks, but also of coming on your, your program and saying something sensible about it. And hopefully um, my thoughts will be useful. What I've tried to do is to try to understand as best I can from where I sit the moment that we're in. Um, but before I say that, I'd like to say that speaking on behalf of my Department of Africana Studies and the Rights and Reason Theater at Brown, I want to extend again our deepest sympathy and respect to the family of George Floyd. We must remember at the heart of this tragedy are human beings who lived meaningful lives, who loved and were loved, and who are now dead. Deepest sympathy is then to, to Floyd's family and to all the families who have lost loved ones to racist police violence. How do we describe the present moment? I want to think about something which I don't think a lot of people have said, that there is in fact majesty 
in the events that we have been privileged to witness over the past two weeks. It is a remarkable thing to see a people awakening and finding their voice. I recall the adage, which I'm sure Tony, you are familiar with, there are decades when nothing happens, when there are weeks when decades happen. I have been thinking about a number of options to describe the present conjuncture, an inflection point, a popular shift, a popular uprising. Each has its strengths and its limitations. This isn't just an inflection. It is more than an inflection. It is not just a shift in mood either. Yet I think it still falls short of an uprising. It is a rising up, but it is not an uprising. If one thinks of an uprising as best illustrated recently in the Egyptian uprising of 2011, this is not that. And certainly, its focus has been around a, sing a singular though profound issue, the question of police and racist violence against black people. As captured effectively in its slogan, black lives matter. Yet to consider this merely a set of demonstrations would be to miss what is happening entirely. I'd like to for the moment consider it a popular upwelling. And by upwelling, I use that in both um, the sense of a stream at its fountainhead, which is finding its way to the surface, as well as in the more emotional sense of upwelling. That means an, an, a, a, releasing, a, a releasing of anger and a, a gathering of waters at the head, at the fountainhead of a river. Let us begin with the sheer scale as captured recently in Putnam, Chenoweth and Pressman's article in the Washington Post of June 6th, headlined, the Floyd protests are the broadest in US history, in which the events of the preceding two weeks are compared with the 2017 Women's March and also briefly with the 1968 protests. These are, uh, Putnam et al. argue, go far beyond both, that is both 2017 and 1968, in reach across all 50 states, in persistence, 10 days and counting at the time that the article was written, and in scale. In the 1960s, demonstrations were primarily re restricted to the cities. These began in the cities and quickly extended into the suburbs and very small rural towns, also reaching across all demographics, with critically young white participants playing significant roles as we moved out of the cities, particularly in smaller cities, towns, and rural areas. A third feature that is perhaps as critical is the global. The full extent of the global reach of the demonstrations is yet to be properly recorded and can't be uh, recorded yet as events are still in motion. But we can consider that Black Lives Matter has reached all major continents with truly impressive popular manifestations across Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean and Australasia. It is both a specific protest against racism in the US, but also serves globally as a catalyst for local manifestations of racism and other forms of structural oppression. Um, thus we see particularly uh, visible manifestations in the UK where statues of slave owners in Bristol or a slave owner in Bristol, uh, you know, happily uh, exhibited for, for however many decades was thrown into uh, the, the very sea in which, uh, if you consider the Atlantic as one ocean, uh, he many decades ago threw slaves on the, the, the trip across the Caribbean. And of course, against Leopold, the, the, the murderer king of, of, the, of, of Belgium, uh, whose record in the Congo of genocide is, is almost unmatched. Um, 
and in, in my, my own homeland of Jamaica, where local instances of incarceration and police violence are incorporated into the demonstrations that have been held uh, in support of what, what is happening in the United States. But to return to the US cockpit, I think it is important to grasp the structural and political implications of what I'm calling a popular upwelling. First of all, it has put tremendous strain on the tenuous political alliances in and around the state. One of the clearest instances of this is only today with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, distancing himself from participation in the Trump bar action against peaceful demonstrators in Lafayette Square and the subsequent photo op with the Bible. It has also laid the foundation for possible fissures within the Republican leadership, so far only evident in Romney's somewhat independent stance and maybe Murkowski, but likely to expand if the polling results, uh, which I suggest are partly influenced by what is happening in the series of demonstrations, continue to drift south. Uh, I also want to consider the rapid realignment of acceptable norms of what Stuart Hall would refer to as common sense, which is an indicator of underlying more fundamental hegemonic ruptures which are taking place. Think how the slogan Black Lives Matter itself has moved from the sidelines only weeks ago to the center of national debate and acceptance. Consider how slogans and uh, policy initiatives like defunding the police, entirely outside of national debate one month ago, is now at center stage. Consider the pace at which the debate around monuments, displaying the Confederate flag at military bases, changing the name of bases named after Confederate generals. Again, note the military position vis-a-vis -vis that of the president. Corporations bending over backwards to express their sympathy and support for black lives. Even NASCAR, NASCAR banning the Confederate hegemonic erosion, brought on, of course, by the slaying of Floyd, the sheer injustice of it against all the other instances, and the remarkable intervention of street journalism that the smartphone allows. And of course, by the huge demonstrations that have occurred as a result. I'm not sure where this goes from here, but politically, it is evident that the firewall of rural majority white votes that both the Republican Party and Trump rely on as their foundation is under threat. This is Putnam et al's point in their article in the Washington Post. This doesn't mean that he will lose in November, but in the midst of a pandemic, a recession, record unemployment, and an enraged population, the Republican Party will either have to work some unimagined policy magic in a context where they have already exhausted most of the macroeconomic options or engage in unprecedented shenanigans at the polls to pull off a win. The latter, of course, that is the well-trodden road of shenanigans is the likely default option. A democratic victory in November, however, with the virus still raging, unemployment in the region of nine plus percent or more and a bleak global economic uh, condition will be the briefest of breathing spaces to address questions like the rethinking of policing and incarceration, the rebuilding of the state to address questions of health, disease prevention, and education. On the matter of education, deep-seated revisions in how history is taught, placing the understanding of race and racism at the center, the rethinking of the global financial economy to appreciate its central road role in breeding inequity, the rapid advance of the green economy as a guiding principle for economic development, the remapping of globalization along lines that appreciate its deeply imbricated reality, but recognize the importance of local supply chains, particularly in light of the need for light carbon footprints, to mention just a few issues that any new uh, regime will have on its agenda. I'd like to conclude my brief comments by cautioning that an upwelling, as I have described this moment, may lead to rapid fundamental change or not, or not. Tahrir Square, after all, 
led via the interregnum of the Muslim Brotherhood to the brutal LCC dictatorship. Nonetheless, as the eternal optimist, I would wish to adopt Arundhati Roy's notion of the pandemic as a portal which might open the door to fundamental global changes and to consider that this moment of popular global upwelling around racial injustice linked as it is inevitably to the pandemic and the deeper institutional crisis in global capital might also be considered in its own, own right a portal with one or many avenues that might lead to fundamental change. And I quote Kamau Brathwaite in the concluding lines of his majestic series of poems, Rites of Passage. Should you shatter the door and walk in the morning, fully aware of the future to come, there is no turning back. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Good evening, everyone. My name is Felicia Deneau. And first, I want to say thank you to CSSJ and the staff there for coordinating this. And I want to thank everyone that's tuned in for sharing space, particularly at a time like this. Um, I'm going to have to move briskly because we're really sticking to this time, <laughs> this time we were allotted. Um, but hopefully there's time for discussion uh, if I can't get to everything. My remarks are more like reflections. What this upwelling, as Dr. Meeks calls it, has given me conceptually. Um, and so it's called All Power to the People, Black Arsonists and the Unnameable War. All power to the people. How intoxicating, how irresistible a promise, or better yet, a threat, as it asks us to find the courage to think power as something other than the capacity to command, this drive to mutilate, or this compulsion to stage white politics and perform its conflicts as if they were our own. Let us practice power as that unassailable defense of black rage, black rebellion, black disgust, and the worlding processes they make available. Let us practice power as a strategic flowering that nurtures tenderness, secures places to lay our bodies, places to give birth, as I will do in a few months, but that also affirms ruthless growth towards liberation. Let us practice power as the refusal of emotional regulation that always seems to stabilize white terror and disappear black suffering. And when I say ruthless growth, I do not mean the desire to accumulate without end, become police or mimic state violence. Instead, I wanna emphasize as Dr. James has said uh, in other forums, that black rebellion, black uprising, black upwelling is always already criminal. That black aliveness is treated as an act of cruelty exercised against the order of things. Ruthless growth means defying this distribution of feeling, and it requires exercise, practice, and commitment. Growing roots don't ask the soil for permission, and if they do, it's in a language with a grammar of mutual injury and repair that we have not yet come to know as humans. I struggled with the idea of speaking because so much, you know, right now, in this moment, in the middle of an uprising, because so much of the violence that Black people experience is bound up in what Haitian novelist Franck Etienne calls the tyranny of the word, or what theorist Sylvia Winter calls narrative condemnation, this absolutely saturated narrative arc, which has us asking questions sometimes, I suspect, that seek closure, resolution, and settlement. Radical possibility must remain open, infinitely open. Questions like what is to be done or where do we go from here have two lives. They can emerge from a profound strategic reckoning with the moment at hand, an attempt to clarify terms and chart possibilities. And here I'm thinking Lenin's What is to be Done and MLK's Where do we go from here, Chaos or Community, his last book before assassination. These kinds of questions, however, can also emerge from a managerial desire for resolutions that don't upend our individual sense of self and perhaps from a fear of coming to terms with the scale and danger of what in fact is to be done. And sometimes these questions disavow the thinking of communities that have dared to posit exactly what is to be done, or in this case, abolition now, an end to policing, an end to prisons, an end to the social conditions and political practices that make punishment, isolation, deprivation, options at all, as Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Miriam Kaba have taught us. Or as Ronaldo Walcott has beautifully written recently, abolition of governance by violence is the only option for our future. 
Indeed, we are living in an inherited condition of governance by violence, the scope of which is global, the lifespan centuries long, total abolition now. One of the difficulties is both expanding the ground of an abolitionist movement, kicking politi political education into high gear, envisioning what it would mean in practical terms to be responsible for the work that has been absorbed by the carceral state, emotional care, redressing harm, material provisioning, while also dealing with an inevitable surge that we're seeing right now in compromises, reforms, and outright accommodation that masquerade as abolition. In order to defend the fullness of our movements and methods, we have to learn how to ask questions, irreverent and searching questions. So for the remainder of my remarks, I wanna spend time on two questions um, that I've been asking. What's fire got to do with it? And what is a war to the black captive? I don't know if we'll have time for the second, but that comes from my main body of research and I hope we do. So I'm gonna speed up. Black rebellion is nearly always flanked by fire. I mean this metaphorically and I mean this physically, like actual fire. And, and so I've been thinking as fire and with fire for some time. I began this line of thought with the Haitian Revolution. Um, how to live a life with and in the fire of 1791 is a question I consistently pose to myself. This is to ask what it means uh, to live in the structural afterlife of the Haitian Revolution, to inherit it as black people everywhere. Uh, it's to, to live in the timescape or register of abolition now, as we've done and as we do and will do. The Haitian Revolution is a fixed point in my imagination, but not for the reasons that one typically cites, but really because these insurgent ancestors of ours acted at the end of the future. They found the end of the future through fire. Dr. James, who can tell is very influential on my thought, writes that slavery and the structure of black captivity is a procedure of time theft. So when I say that the slaves of Saint-Domingue acted at the end of the future, I'm saying they inaugurated and inhabited a timescape that ended the future as it was to be known. Time in the ruins never knows of time on the other side. They set fires not knowing they were stepping into a 13 year struggle on the other side of which would be Haiti itself. And the evacuation of time is perhaps one of the early signs of a gestating liberation movement. Time is one of those axes along which domination exerts itself most forcefully. And I'm thinking about Nicole Fleetwood's recent work and her concept of penal time in relation to the prison. If the gun is a constitutive technology of white supremacy, then fire in original organic form, because the gun is a firearm, is a constitutive technology of black rebellion. The Haitian revolution begins with the ritual use of fire at a secret Voudan ceremony. And here fire is a meeting ground, a landing, a translation point between the human and the spirit. The uprising translates into a coordinated arson of plantation estates across Northern Haiti, which then fans out until the island is engulfed in protracted rebellion. And this is a repeated process or this technique across the black world long before the Haitian revolution and long after. During the New York slave revolt of 1712, the enslaved set fire to a building near Broadway. And when the slave owners converged to put the fire out, they were ambushed. During the slave conspiracy of 1741, fires raged across Manhattan over the course of several weeks with increasing frequency. frequency. And eventually a coordinated plot among the enslaved was identified. Some of these things are historically contested, culpability that is. There are also individual acts of alleged arson, like in the case of Marie-Joseph Angelique in New France in Canada. She was tried and executed for supposedly setting a fire that engulfed much of old Montreal. We can zoom forward through the 20th century where, the, where fire was a principal method of inner city rebellion and land on the LA riots of 92. There was a concerted effort among law enforcement to track and charge arsonists in the wake of the rebellion. And you can kind of search for those headlines. And this is really what I wanna think about, the legal category of arson or the criminal act of deliberately setting fire to property. Arson is the conceptual meeting point, the criminalization of fire and the sanctification of property. A lot of the images that came out of Minneapolis were that of raging fires and right behind them were the critiques of destroying one's community, the sorting of violent and nonviolent unrest and even pleas from Atlanta among the black elite to protect the city that has given so much. What this managerial response does is trivialize fire as pedagogy and fire as a black critique of property itself. This moment is both about a refusal of routine terror, a stepping out of fear, but in its own way has launched like fires before it, a calling into question of the ethics of property as a category. 
and, and this is more than putting people over property. It's about how property informs what is and is not personhood. How many times have we parted with property to launch more fundamental critiques of political order? And so when I say we should practice power as the defense of black rage, that means searching for our own theoretical bedrock. In our world, fire is a conceptual intervention. And so I'll quickly turn to this question of what is a word of the black captive? Um, and it's the beginning of how I think about war in my own work or this protracted experience of organized violence. And I think about it as the structuring condition of black life. And I have this concept of unnameable war. I think it's kind of, it's difficult to communicate because this originally was written to be read, but I, I'm gonna try to go through it in the time I have remaining. And uh, because I, it's how I'm thinking about what is this violence? What is the nature of the violence we experience both in the homeland here, but around the world? So war is the socially disavowed, structurally disguised and theoretically denied condition of black captivity and the ongoing organized rebellion against it. It's through this very disavowal and denial that we are not at war. It's through this structural life of the unnameable war that the Euro-American capacity to wage war itself is constantly remade. Indeed, the un unnameable war is the secret ritual of white worlding. And war for me serves as this filtration device that sorts and claims forms of violence towards various ends, but ultimately functions to designate the space of the homeland. War making is directed to those that are outside the homeland, lest it be qualified as civil, or any of the other categories that indicate the homeland is not the implied, the homeland as the state, is not the implied legitimate domain of war powers, tribal war, colonial war, guerrilla war. The homeland becomes the domain and the, for the forms and practices of violence that fall below the threshold or uh, outside the purview of war. The forms of violence built into the homeland or ushered under the sign of law. So I think about war and law as alter egos. When war becomes the primary configuration of black capture, when we, we can begin to ask different questions about violence, nature, um, empire, the nation, empire, diaspora, the category of war of the world and liberation strategies. For me, slavery, colonialism, labor and resource extraction are expressions of the fundamental framework of the unnameable war. And it's a claim about language. We narrate uh, the US aggression in the Middle East as forever wars or the Euro-American aggression. I'm trying to think about a claim about language. And the disappearing of war's primacy in accounts of black life is a redaction. It's a hegemonic redaction, an erasure that attempts to domesticate violence to the nation state. And it situates it within the domain of individual legal systems, which are themselves expressions of the unnameable war. The conceptual sorting of violence, that which is and is not war, that which is war and that which is law, disappears the unique position of the black captive Who's in, who, in whose presence these categories falter, they disassemble. Um, and the, this instability for me of categories like war, law, and violence are leveraged to preserve black exposure to war making. Um, and I think I will finish there. And I just, just to reiterate, I slid this into the end because we need to study with urgency, continue studying the nature of the violence we experience, how it's organized and how it's reproduced across the black world. And I will, one more line, I'll finish with the time for abolition is now the, the time to name, condemn and eliminate these warlike conditions. This unnameable war is also now. Thank you, Felicia. Okay, um, thank you. And Professor Bogues, Professor Weeks, Ms. Felicia Brown for uh, this opportunity to try to think um, admits like all of us feeling overwhelmed and also a grief. So you've provided a container and I think this is something of what Felicia was referencing. I wanna keep my, Remar I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief. Um, it's been difficult to think in these moments. I'm sure that's true of everybody, but the brilliance and, and the community commitment here is heartening. Um, tentatively, I titled this when I heard my mother say, and that's in quotes, 
and I, I got that, I'm indebted to, so this is dedicated to a young black man who was on the corner um, around Broadway and 100th, I'm in Manhattan, um, on Monday when they opened New York again. And, and you know, he had his, his, his radio on and his song was playing. He had his mask below his um, chin. He had a blunt in one hand and he was blowing smoke. And so he self-medicated and he was taking up space. But at very high risk of NYPD incursion, you know, upon him. And then when I listened to the refrain, it was amazing because I remembered it from my childhood uh, growing up in, you know, military family with a military officer. So I'm familiar with war on, on at least a couple of dimensions. And the refrain was, I was slipping into darkness when they took my friend away. I was slipping into darkness when they took, when they took my friend away. And then the last refrain, when I heard my mother say, you've been slipping into darkness, pretty soon you're gonna pay. And that's from War, um, you know, from the title, Slipping Into Darkness. And it was an anthem of um, the precarity that we face in this moment, but also the frontline people who are gonna be most at risk on the streets, right? Like I can go to the park with my ID in a city, which I want to talk about it for a moment as context before I share some reflections on family, on um, politics as war, which I'm echoing some of what uh, Ms. Felicia put out. And also uh, this question of is abolitionism the same as revolution? Because I'm completely confused at this. Like, are we revolutionaries? Are we abolitionists? Is, are they just synonyms for each other? So um, with this anthem of slipping into darkness, which I agree with Professor Meeks, like the other side, there are these rays of light that we can walk towards. I want to set this up a bit, this reflection with a quote from Vincent Brown's Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war. And this is his quote. Slaveholders cited black militancy as a justification for their brutality. In response, late 18th century abolitionists would rally around the image of a kneeling supplicant begging to be recognized as a man and a brother, as if the condemnation of evil required the meek innocence of its victims. That icon of abjection has shaped the prevailing understanding of bondage and race to this day. And so I wanna use that to, to think about when I heard my mother say, I mean, in part just about the images that have become iconic that are radiating not just across the country, but across the world, a black victimization, which in that narrative is this call to the mother and this sort of nestling with the mother. And so even in listening to the funeral, and I obviously have no judgment, criticism of anything or anyone, I'm just trying to understand where we are in this moment. There's this return to the mother that becomes a promise of sanctuary. Like what is not available while you breathe on earth becomes a possibility. And so when Mr. Floyd calls out to his mother and when Houstonians, Black Houston members who grew up with him say, and I know his mother was there and she got him and she brought him to him. I mean, it's, it's a transition literally out of hell and to some form of heaven. And that becomes, I believe, a, a basis of our emotional sustenance and emotional intelligence. But it also, in this culture, which is all about capitalism and markets, it also becomes a commodity, you know, that becomes like a, a photo, an image, um, Biden, you know, speaking at one, you know, in terms of one of the eulogies, addressing it to Mr. Floyd's six-year-old daughter um, with the soundtrack, you know, musical background to it. There is a, a way in which the performative overwhelms our grief and our suffering becomes like the acceptable replacement for our militancy. And so I want to I want to move from that with the you know the critique that gestures to the international that you've all laid out the way in which our suffering is just like the tabula rasa I mean it's a lingua franca everybody speaks this language even those who don't live it 
because they purchase it through the video, nightly news, the documentaries, the journalists, the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanna look at three things. I wanna look at family, right? I wanna look at, as I said, politics is war. And I, I wanna close with this question, is abolitionism revolutionary struggle? And, and I do not have the answer. I just wanna pose it. So in the construct of family, like it's not just when I heard my mother say, it's also, um, I'm trying to be mindful of time too. It's also um, that this is the parent and that there are male parents and that there are entire families that are traumatized. So the last time we were together, we, we talked about the data that was out that if you're in a black community and there's an unarmed black person killed by the police, um, mothers who are pregnant are less likely to have a healthy delivery and less likely to have a thriving baby that, you know, this trauma is radiating through our communities, through generations, right, and becomes a literally a health crisis on top of the crisis of pandemic and poverty and the lack of adequate and equitable um, medical treatment. But in this precarity that I'm talking about in terms of what I've heard my mother say, and it's not just the biological mother, it's also the father, it is also the children who survive and who are orphaned, it's also the siblings. I think we might begin to think about this as a political unit, that family is a political unit that is mobilized and that can be co-opted by the state. So I wanna give a quick example. Uh, I think back to the 2016 DNC convention in Philadelphia, where Hillary Clinton had surrogates, right? The mothers, again, this template of the, of the grieving mother, the mothers of, um, we know these young, these young men are teenagers, Trayvon Martin um, and women, Sandra Bland, are, are mobilized for the Democratic Party and for us to come out to vote. But one of the things we also know from the hacking of the DNC emails, John Podesta's emails, right, by assuming Ricky Leach, Julian Assange, um, is that all delegates who have a link to officialdom, to the state, to government, were instructed that whenever people say Black Lives cheer, but whenever they ask about policy, like exactly what will the government do to demonstrate that black people's lives matter, don't answer that question. And when you know, I'm reading this leaked data, I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense because nobody can answer that question. Like when the structure, within the structure itself, there is no mechanism for reform that is not performative, right? And as performance, right? It becomes a healing salve, it becomes entertainment, et cetera, et cetera, but it cannot deliver on any stable notion of freedom or liberation from state violence or state terror, because it's not designed to deliver that to people who used to be property in an imperial democracy that only values property as God, right? As worth living, worth sustaining. So we have a whole lineage of the way in which families have mobilized, they have rebelled, they don't have to be biological, they can be political. I would mention quickly and then move on, um, this awarding Ida B. Wells the Pulitzer. That's great. But the depiction of Wells as a journalist who chronicles terror and horror, right? Again, to say Black is to say terrorized, is to sell newspapers. Um, Wells was also a, an astute activist. And what I heard one black clergy member um, mention earlier, this, this frame that he delivered to his church, if you kill us, we will kill your economy. It reminds me that Wells went to England and created this boycott of cotton that devastated the economy. So there are ways in which we're being politicized as family units, but there's no real record of that. It becomes subsumed under this narrative of our suffering rather than the narrative of our, mobili our mobilization and our resistance. And I, you know, again, there's, as we all know, there's just not ever enough time we'll be doing, talking about and struggling with this. 
until we pass on, but I want to move from, from wealth to um, this notion of politics as war. All right, so we have a problem internally in terms of class among Black people in the United States. And, in, and since this is global, those discussions will happen around the world. Um, but internally, if we have a critique, a critique like E. Franklin Frazier first wrote in, in 1929 of the Black bourgeoisie in an article, and then when he's in Paris or in France, or maybe it was Belgium, I'm sorry, he's working with UNESCO. In 1955, he writes the Black bourgeoisie in French, and then it's translated later into English, and it radiates back into the United States. It reflects the fact that we are not unified. And I think Ms. Felicia pointed to this in talking about these Black mayors, Black um, attorney generals, Black people who work in the state who have accumulated access to power by being loyal, but also we exist not in a bubble that spares us from racist violence and denigration, but property Blacks are least likely to end up under the knee of a white cop. It's gonna be more the working class and the poor. And I'm not sure that we've reconciled ourselves who is going to lead, right? There are ways in which um, what we share as a universal family, as a politicized family, is not quite articulated with the specificity of who is most at risk for a lynching. Um, and as I run out of time, I want to move to the third part. All right, so abolitionism and revolution. They're connected, but I'm not sure they're the same. In um, Chicago, in November of last year, there was the refounding of the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. It had first been founded in 1972 or 73 out of Angela Davis's Defense Committee. And at that time, it worked on the Joanne Little case, it worked on Eddie Carthen cases, like political and racist repression focused in the United States, right? But using those legal technical skills and political narrative that helped um, to rightly acquit and exonerate um, Professor Davis. But in the refounding in November, you could see the schism of the left, of the multiracial left, right? That at one point there were these calls and, and Professor Davis was keynote for abolitionism. Another count, there was like, I don't want restorative justice with police. They've terrorized us. I don't even know how this works. How would I be even emotionally equipped for this? What is the political project? And to one point, a, the, a one leader, black male who had been incarcerated for years stated, I'm fine with abolitionists, but I am not an abolitionist. I am a revolutionary, which for me brings us to capitalism in the end. Um, the state is an edifice, right? constantly reinventing itself through reforms, usually shaped you know, out, of, out of the blood and the death of those it deems disposable. We could have a peaceful revolution, but it doesn't seem like there's language in which we articulate that. And I am not convinced that taking on the police or the prisons, which are all paramilitarized, right? but paramilitarized because they're getting surplus from this endless war of terror that we got into with bogus claims of weapons of mass destruction from the Bush administration. And I wanna point out, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, who are very successful black people, facilitated that war. Again, black people are not necessarily unified about what to do with a white supremacist empire. And I, I worry and I ponder, right, when I heard my mother say um, that we're slipping into darkness, that maybe we don't want to enter a war with an empire that will not necessarily allow the most privileged of us, of all sectors, progressive, of all ethnicities and races, to be able to hold court with the official predators, also known as POTUS 45. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor James. Thank you.
We do have a question from the audience. It came in okay. from Servio G. And the question is, what limitations do you see in the growing demands to defund the police? How likely do you think those demands will actually lead to the eventual abolition of police? And what promises or limitations do you see in the goal of abolishing the police? Any, any member of the panel who wants to answer that? And Joy just spoke somewhat about it, but any member who wants to answer it, please go ahead. Well, I mean, if you don't mind me speaking yeah, again. Yeah. So our mayor, de Blasio, um, and again, it, part of this, this projection of progressivism is definitely tied to race, right? So he has two black children, has a black wife, and that was always touted out as progressivism. When the activists, and mostly you know, youth activists in the city were trying to defund the police, he was against it. But the police violence against protesters in New York City was so vicious, right? And even though de Blasio backed the police, I, I believe it was only a couple of days ago that he agreed to defunding. He will not specify how much out of a $6 billion budget that the NYPD has will be directed to, quote, social services. Originally under the austerity measures set by Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, they were cutting all funding for youth summer programs. Um, in our state next door, New Jersey, 90% of the students never got laptops. So even though we've been doing distance learning in New York City, the kids who have the least resources are not doing distance learning. Also, the teachers, you know, protected by their unions, and we could debate police unions versus other unions, but they were not mandated to even be live on instruction. So some of them were really dedicated and pushed through and trying to have face-to-face -face with students um, from pre-K pre on or K on, first grade on. But, you know, others were basically doing what they thought was necessary for themselves. So we can push to defund the police and i'm for it one billion is the request that's being asked i think that's low ball figure but what does it mean to control the police and defunding them is not controlling them and so what does it mean to control budgets and allocations and not allow people to move money around like put it in this fund and let the police borrow it or you know undercover put it you know we had to stop the transit transit police coming in, Cuomo mandated $500 million for cops in the subways because there's no program to house the homeless. So they're sleeping there. And yes, that becomes where they eat, it becomes their resting places, bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But the NYPD is used to clear them out, right? So in the lack of controlling government, you can move money around, you can take money from an entity. It doesn't mean, given the stronghold that the NYPD has over the mayor and their alliance, the police unions with the government, because police unions have PACs, so they give to elections. Unless you can control the elected officials to actually monitor that defunding and maintain it, it's gonna be a Sisyphus endeavor. One I support, but you have to be constantly vigilant. Just a brief remark, because I think it was Servio who's based in Rhode Island, and just something that COVID, and I'm sure you know this, uh, you know, there was a Providence City Council had its budgeting meeting, and now because of COVID, which has kind of restructured how governance is working, it was via Zoom, racists flooded kind of the comments and calls, preventing the roster of people that were going to, you know, contribute testimony as to what they wanted to be done with the budget. And so they use that to kind of shut down the conversation and to skirt any contestation of what the budget actually is. And so I'm interested in addition to this idea of controlling the police, the way mechan like COVID is reshaping governance, COVID is reshaping access to these things um, and what consolidations and what breakings. And just on the note of defunding, I think you're seeing it being severed from a method towards a path of abolition um, to an end in, in and of itself. And um, I, I say that, that sharpening very quickly. 
Um, and I think that Dr. James's point to this idea of hiding, shuffling money is what, when we settle on defunding as an arrival and not as a, tra like a, you know, a, a connecting device towards abolition, you know, it's going to be kind of the shuffling she, she talks about. And I think that the defense of our categories, that was my emphasis on the conceptual uh, and political education is becoming urgent. You know, it's both exciting that some of these things are on the table, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous when it moves from the underground in certain ways, especially when you don't have the proper defense mechanisms intellectually and materially, the relationships to defend our methods um, and both sort of the conceptual weight to do so as well. Professor Meeks? Yeah, I just, I just wanna come in there, you know, quite, I'm, you know, I'm very humble when thinking about slogans and positions that have come out of a popular movement um, and you know having a very sharp response to them without understanding all of the the tributaries that have brought us to that point nonetheless you know i want to to build in a way and i don't know if in building i am disagreeing with with either joy or felicia but i want to build to suggest that um it seems to me that what the objective here is to root out, root out the racism, the classism, and the brutality that is obviously deeply embedded within the, the, um, the police force and the security apparatus. It seems to me that, that the the, the, the slogan defund the police has in it the danger of, of what obviously the right then, then holds on to, which is in the absence of, of any form. If the police are defunded, it, uh, ergo, there is no police. Ergo, there is no security. Ergo, there is anarchy, right? as opposed to a, a slogan which, 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 which speaks to reinventing the police in a fundamental way, reinventing the notion of security in a fundamental way, which would obviously require a shifting of funding uh, away from um, you know, militarized policing towards social services, towards educational opportunities and so on and so, so, so forth. But is that captured in the slogan, defund the police? Uh, or, or is it captured in another yet to be imagined slogan that, um, that reinvents the process of, of security? And it seems to me that, uh, the, that uh, you know, I say that with humility because uh, you know, you know, there, there's, there's profound power in that slogan on the one hand, um, but I think there's also danger in it. Thank you. Can we take another question, Catherine? Yes, we had two similar questions from Andrea O'Neill and Servio G. What differences do you see between this recent wave of mass mobilizations compared to the last significant wave of mass mobilizations after the Ferguson Rebellion? Does this moment feel different in a way that we might have seen that we might not have seen in the last 50 plus years? That that was that was essentially the, the the substance of my of my intervention in that this is new, uh, this the, the 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 quality and the scale of what we are looking at is what is is unprecedented here. Um, you know, one thinks back to the civil rights movement and its its stretch over over decades, literally, uh, or one thinks about the the rapidity of 1968 as, as a year or, you know, as, as a year of concentrated uh, movement. But uh, this particular, particular event on its scale and the way in which it, 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 it has jumped fences so rapidly. You know, I'm thinking about the longshoremen uh, expressing solidarity. I'm thinking about um, the transport workers in um, New York uh, expressing resistance on carrying um, uh, uh, people that the police have arrested in, in the public buses. Um, there, there are lots of things that are happening. And of course, the thing that is most obvious is, 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 is the, which, which is the point I made, which is, is the multiracial character of it, uh, which, which has 
both a profound implication for popular mobilization, but also comes with dangers which are inherent in, in any form of broad coalition movement. But the main thing is, is, is the rapidity, um, the scale, um, and the, the, the persistence of this, of this movement over, over two weeks. But you know, consider it, two weeks of people in the street uh, across the country and then globally as well. Um, th this, this is new. We need to see that. Thank you. And anybody else want to? Yeah, I would. Go ahead, Doctor. Right, go ahead. Okay, I would add to that. Um, and that was a really, thank you for laying that up, setting that up. Um, because of the pandemic, right? There are so many people dispossessed, just to go back to this city, right? Because we've been here for three months in the apartment, sneaking out for walks. Um, but okay, because I have a white collar job, right? Um, there, there are food lines, like people are going hungry. There was one moment where a year ago um, in March or something, people were dying 20 a day based on EMS responses. And when COVID hit, people were dying in their apartment 200 to 300 a day. And then they just stopped giving us the numbers because they look bad. So they just focused on the hospital. But if you jump from 200 to 300 to 20, or maybe max 30 a day, then you, you've magnified like the losses that people are experiencing besides the losses of their jobs, their losses of their loved ones, of family members, of friends. And I think that's mobilized, at least in the, <coughs> sorry, the New York City protests. I think that sense that people have been abandoned Literally, and, and New York State messed up. I'll just put it out there. It's a longer story, but people have been abandoned and now a sizable number are unemployed. And so that, that sense of vulnerability, I think, has, it does not mean that they're not trying to be anti-racist or not anti-racist, but that economic precarity, if we're in a recession, that means Black people are in a depression, right? That economic precarity has just fueled rage against the state apparatus, but particularly the police who exist to protect property from 1790 slave patrols, right? When we were property. And so their violence is totally untenable when you're hungry, unemployed, don't have housing security. And it's not just you, but it radiates among different sectors in the city. And thanks, Professor James. Alicia, you wanted to say something or? Yeah, just two thoughts, kind of on mm -hmm. the COVID line, which is I've just been in awe when you're contending with two conditions of death dealing and you march into one, you march into the condition of transmission because the other is absolutely intolerable and to be wedged between two different programs of death like that. Um, and for the people to make that choice, to me, is distinctive. Um, and then I'm thinking about something like Moms for Housing. And I'm thinking about the just structural ability to, re the capacity we've actually cultivated to respond since Ferguson. And Moms for Housing was around, I think, November of this year. And garnered a lot of attention and, and also functions in a different, I'm thinking about, you know, Dr. James's remarks on, on the mother, and it's a different function of the mother. Um, but I'm just thinking about there, the seedlings that actually precede this explosion. And then the way I see moms for housing linking up with black, like some of these movements that are emerging now. And I'm just thinking about our capacity to respond where we are just the relationships we've built in the interim. And then this resolve to step into the line of transmission to say something. I don't think you turn back from that, that choice. Because now we are gonna deal with another wave. We're gonna deal with another peak and we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna help each other through that. Um, and I think that will also change the terms of this conversation because the sacrifices that people made are gonna become apparent very quickly. Thank you, Felicia. Catherine? Yes, we had two uh, sort of similar questions that came in from Nicole Kim and Diana Pettet. 
Um, a lot of you talked about capitalism and how the system that values property has created the conditions that perpetuate black death. What do you think we can do to resist this system while we also live within it and participate in it? And also on the discussion about fire and about the shifting meaning and significance of property, how do you think property should be reevaluated and revalued? I think um, in my remarks, all I wanted to point out was the critique underneath, the critique that gets explained away, the critique that gets disappeared in the hands of those loyal to the state, as Dr. James called them, and that Black revolt often is a discussion about property, not in the terms that the left um, is used to or the script that the left is used to. And I just want to make myself attuned. And that's another thing. I want, I think I tweeted something like, I want the rebellion to dress and unrobe itself as it wants and to generate its own terms. So I'm very hesitant to, like doc, in sort of Dr. Meeks's advice, to, to make any claims, to make, to impose any categorical, you know. But there's a critique of property that's emerging. It often has to do with fire and personhood. Um, and, and that's kind of what I want to start us to start to begin to like circle around. And I think that uh, we really, we have to contest that the function of the police both is to terrorize, control, and survey Black communities, but also to ensure the reproduction of private property. Um, and that does get disappeared a little bit when, when we think about, it's another kind of terror, uh, the, pro the way property is protected. Um, and sometimes it does slip out of the conversation. So I just wanted to, and that's why I go to the Haitian Revolution, because it's, it's destruction of the estate, it's expropriation of the weapons, it's abolition and revolution in a single, well, not single because it's 13 years, but it has, it has all of the, this torque and it has all of these moving parts that could really inform um, the juncture that we're at and how we start to thread these different lines of analysis and method together. Um, but one thing I've been struggling with is black death can't be the momentum the left relies on all the time. And so I'm in search of um, how we can begin to pull out these other critiques that sort of black resistance makes and how we can start to center them. But it's exhausting for like someone tweeted something quite funny that like Bernie was the momentum for this, you know, like, you know, past year and a half or whatever, and then look, I mean, he's just obliterated in the wake of this. And it's like, but Black death cannot be the radical momentum. It, we need to create a different kind of um, spirit and sustain it. And so I'm, I was just trying to sniff around what I was seeing coming out of particularly Minneapolis. I mean, they burned down a police station. That really stepping out of terror was another thing thing I was trying to hone on like wow when you really confront what terrorizes you that is what's really underneath the unnameable war and black revolt globally it is looking terror in the eyes and saying no more enough is enough um, and so I just want to think about terror and property but also what are the other critiques that black people are making other than you not you know we are dying that's, but there is a way the world gloms on to black suffering when there's such complexity and there's such richness to our method, uh, to our complaint and to uh, the vision we have for each other. The you know, black aliveness is something I got from Kevin Kwashi who wrote recently about Dr. Hartman's wayward lives. Uh, and so I'm trying to think about um, all of these terms. And so black suffering is not the only currency. It's not the motor. It's not the, the, the you know, the generator. Um, what are our methods actually saying to us? Yeah, yeah, if I could jump in. Thanks for that, Felicia. Um, I agree that we, we're, we're an iconic appearance on the landscape, on political landscapes. Either we're being demonized and hated, like if POTUS 45 is actually going to have a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma on Juneteenth, then he's messaging through white supremacy. 
So we're kind of, you know, we're the fulcrum. Everything's going to rest like a plank on top, right? And kind of balance itself, not always with our best interests in mind. But I do want to go back to this notion of the police or policing. And I, I just want to repeat that it is not just a domestic phenomenon, right? Because um, the generals that came out for the photo op, and some people say he was holding the Bible upside down. I have to look at the photo again. But when Trump like comes out, right? And that you clear what, you know, peaceful, largely peaceful, but the DEA is there, the National Guard from different states are there. It's like controlling the local police will be insufficient. The POTUS has already told like liberal, you know, governors and mayors, if you can't handle it, I will nationalize and send in my own people, right? Who have really fidelity not to the constitution, but to this notion of rule and domination, which he is popularizing, you know, while actually creating mayhem. So unless we're situated in an international struggle with the understanding that the US the corporate interests, state corporate interests seek capital and accumulation, not just within our national boundaries, which is why we have bases all over the world or drone strikes in Africa and elsewhere, right? That was Obama too. There's no way to take on, on capitalism inside the US because it doesn't, it's not just bedded. I mean, New York City is the epicenter, not just of COVID, you know, but it, or some forms of police brutality, but integrated systems of policing, like when Giuliani went to Israel and was training the police there, or sorry, it was Brazil and training police in Brazil, but the NYPD has relationships with Israeli military police. I mean, it's a global um, assault on humanity that we would have to like deal with on both the national level, domestic level, but also in the international foreign policy level. Yeah, I, I, I'd just like to come in there with a sort of piggyback point really. And you know, recalling Du Bois's notion of the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line and linking that into the notion of capital. And if we think of capital as in, inevitably um, uh, intricately connected to race, um, then the struggle against race and uh, against racism is a struggle against, against capital. It is inevitably bound together. And what we're seeing here is, in, in, in essence, uh, a 21st century uh, reaffirmation of Du Bois's point for the 20th century that the problem of race in the United States is a placeholder for the problem of exploitation internationally and is being reflected in the international global nature of the support for um, what is happening here as well as um, reinterpreted uh, to suit the conditions in every country in which uh, these demonstrations are taking place. So I think that uh, I don't think we're going to see uh, some new kind of um, movement with, with against capital as its banner. Um, but we're going to have movements like this. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I just want to raise one additional point is that the extraordinarily decentralized nature and spontaneous nature of, of this movement is, is another factor which, which suggests to us it's, it's um, the extent both of its innovativeness but also of its connectedness into broader questions that go obviously beyond the immediate one of police violence, which is a cutting edge, but addresses the whole panoply of issues uh, that, that face us today. Um, issues of the economy, issues of, of the collapse of the state as an effective means of combating uh, uh, infection. Um, and of doing a whole variety of things which we expected the state to do uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I, 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 in a sort of roundabout, bumbling way, I'm, I'm just really trying to say that um, this, in many respects, is a struggle against capital. I had one more point, um, just 
because I also hate to leave to freeze Haiti in the Haitian Revolution. And Dr. Meeks and I were in a class, Global Black Radicalism, in the fall. And that was really the height of the Petro Carib Rebellion, which involved Venezuela's Petro Carib Fund, which was, you know, lotted out to different Caribbean nations, Haiti being one, something to, you know, like four, uh, you know, billion dollars that were smuggled by a regime that was U.S. approved, and obviously the antagonism between Venezuela and the U.S. Um, and so they, there was a popular uprising that really lasted about a, a year or more. Um, but it, it's going to force us also when we start to think about counterinsurgency internationally and policing, um, especially in black state, black led black states. Um, it kind of brings to the fore different contradictions that I think can help, help us work out issues here as well. But I did just thinking about this moment, Petro Carib, and now this and the kind of critique of property I'm trying to bring in, there are these threads that have not yet been woven. Um, and I don't know, I just wanted to cite that as something that had been going on for a year prior to COVID and to think about the contradictions that it highlights, the embezzlement of funds to a, a, a country that is absolutely one of the most under-resourced in the world, you know, uh, that has this legacy of burning itself down for the sake of the space of freedom, um, the role of Venezuela and the way the US acts as the shadow, and then these kind of questions about the relationship between counterinsurgency um, sort of uh, practices that then come back home and get exported and have this, this mounting relationship. Oh, okay, thank you, Catherine. Any, any? Yes, we have a question from Rocky Douglas who asks, how do we grapple with trauma in Black freedom struggles? The generational trauma in these families, the trauma of stepping into the transmission, the trauma of being unfree for centuries. What is the role of care and trauma work within these movements in ways that do not become performative mechanisms for reform? Professor James, if I may. Uh, that yeah, that's what I was trying to gesture to. And, you know, honestly, I don't have answers. I know there are different organizations that work on restorative justice, that work on healing. I mean, I know that Professor Bogues and CSSJ are going to put up a list of resources after um, we finish this call. But one thing I do want to say about trauma are a couple of things, right? I wanna go back to the issue of class divisions in the black communities, right? That, you know, Erica Gardner before she died, and I would say from trauma, in part fighting with New York City and Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo and President Obama to get justice for her father, that she talked about, um, the cost of mental health support, like it's $300 an hour. Like she does not have access to, to those kinds of funds. And then she's the mother of two small children. So yes, there are these ways in which our emotional care is absolutely vital so that we um, have some longevity so that hypertension and depression don't become our daily fare and that we try to you know survive on that and again people can find in their local communities and cities what is coming from the state in terms of services which you know i won't pass comment on but what people are cre creating among themselves and even therapists who's like donated their services in new york city um, under COVID. But again, you would have to be plugged into some kind of health insurance, right? 80 million people in the United States don't have health insurance. You would have to feel that you're not being racially denigrated while you're seeking those services. So the ways in which our community can build these healing circles, these prayer circles, um, I've seen them done by Christians, by black Muslims, the different ways in which they take care of each other, even online, you know, in virtual, spiritual sharing and one last thing i want to quickly share is like one of the things that happened last november is i got to hear the parents of diane diane jones speak and again this is about economic disparities so he was found um lynched in his family's yard his mother was an activist during ferguson the police ruled it a homicide 
even though the details of it made no sense, you know, the chairs on the other side, his pants were rolled down to his knees. He could, the sheet never came from their house or any of their linen set. But there's a way in which the stories of us being traumatized can only be consumed up to a certain level. And then we forget about the people, if that makes sense at all. I mean, including the people who are the new political prisoners, right? There are people who are still in prison from the rebellion or uprising in Ferguson, but you know, we don't know their names, right? There are people who are gonna be political prisoners in New York City, there already are, but you know, after all the surveillance tapes are reviewed, someone's gonna come knock on their door in terms, I saw you at this demonstration, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So our caretaking, yes, has to be everyday caretaking. And it also has to be amplified to take care of the political activists who take the most risk. Not saying that there's a hierarchy of care or value, but the people who are on the front lines, including the political prisoners who are still in decades later from the Black Panther Party, writer Leonard Peltier from AIM, they have surplus torture and trauma because they're recognized as political opponents to the state. And I think that added level of care and protection has to be part of our movements. Great, thanks, Professor Jim. We have a question that came in from Abdullah Shihapar asking, how do we deal with the need for political education in this very fast paced moment? What does this work mean for revolts of the future? And what can we learn from revolts of the past on this question of political education for newcomers? Sure, I think the one thing I know is that political education is more than a book list. And so I think this also goes to Rocky's question of relationships and how do we prioritize um, how do we prioritize building relationships which is not as organic or as easy or as straightforward um, as I think we imagine and so part of it is strained in the COVID era um, but in thinking about linking this these two last questions you know, I have, one of my friends said, you know, I can't be online, so I miss things. I can't be processing every episode, every update, every rally. I'm, I'm somebody that likes to immerse themselves. But what I did is I started a, a phone tree, which is very simple, but okay, I will call this person and this person will call that person and that person will call that person. And these are some people that I have not known before. But I'm trying to think about what the relationality of revolt actually is in learning. Learning is intimate. Learning is vulnerable. Learning is just, it's intense, it's emotionally intensive. These are not the things that happen in the university, but I think political education at its best has all of these things. And when it's orchestrated that way, it is healing. Um, when you can be your full self and you can bring the parts of you that are shameful, the desires that are shameful, and you can think through them, but you can feel through them. So I think how, what do relationships mean generally and in COVID? How do we build a, an emotional intelligence around relationship building? Um, and how do we not overwhelm people? I mean, I have a thousand book lists in, you know, saved in different places, but what does it mean to tailor knowledge? What does it mean to tailor questions for specific people, for specific struggles? Um, but I think the piece I really want to work on is the relationality and, um, of learning. And, and that's going to be, I think, especially in my situation where I cannot be on the front line or in the streets, as I'm used to, I've had to reimagine what support looks like. Um, and I think being the conduit, being the person that strings the people and the things and the events together is actually, it's a, it's a devalued um, role. And it's, it's actually what reproduces the movement um, or what I like to call a reproductive life of revolution. Um, who makes the coffee? who does the photocopies, these things. But so in this moment, I'm thinking about, it's not just book lists, it's relationships, 
it's about a tenderness. Um, and that's what I meant by a ruthless growth, which is that's what we prioritize is each person, each collective's ability to grow without limit. Yeah, one more question, Catherine, and then I think we might have to wrap up. All right, our last question comes from Adam King, who is curious about the intersection of suffering, as Dr. James articulates it, and the metaphorical image of the fire Felicia Genode spoke so thoughtfully about. What do we do with the internalization of that fire to protect ourselves? And what do we do to prevent individuals from inspiring an internalization of that fire in others? I think we have a very a few minutes so people who panelists may have to respond very quickly, not may, will have to respond very quickly. I'll go quickly. I've been thinking a lot about fear and fury, right? We embody them both. And also I've been thinking about a way people talk about a quote, a disability as being differently abled. So if trauma is, and I've used this riffing off of what Greta Thunberg, the climate warrior has said about having Asperger's and her crew having Asperger's, if trauma becomes our superpower, we can repurpose it and, and mutate. We've been doing it for centuries anyway. So the ability to love and rage simultaneously actually is in our tradition. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor James. Um, this has been, a, I think, a very rich uh, discussion. So I would like to thank all the panelists. I'd like to thank the audience for participating and for, uh, for sending us questions. Uh, those questions that were not answered, we will collect them and we will try and answer them, as well as we will send out a set of resources um, to all the persons who signed up to join, uh, to, to, to join this particular uh, event. I just want to end by saying that the, there's, a, there's a, a pamphlet written in about 1943 that comes out of Detroit, um, written by an African-American woman. Um, who makes the point and that the Negro struggle, and at that time black folks were being called Negro, she says the Negro struggle is the touchstone of America. And I think what she meant was that, the, that what happens to black people is in fact the touchstone of United States. And that if you need to remake the United States, and I would argue to remake the world, then you're going to have to start from making sure that black lives matter and that black people can breathe and that the nightmare and the death that we experience living while black has ended. Thank you all for watching this. Thank you again for participating. And uh, we, will, we hope to continue this series uh, over the next uh, few months. Thank you all very much. <laughs>